Hello, everyone. I'm excited to welcome you to what I think is going to be an amazing conversation today. Uh, the title of our session is Who Made It? We're going to be talking about how to make sure that as we are making thoughtful choices about our fashion, our jewelry, our home goods, that we're understanding about the opportunity to invest in sustainably sourced products that help empower women. Before I get into the panel, I do have a couple of housekeeping uh, notes to share with you. First of all, at any time, please feel free to use the chat for comment, for questions. Uh, the chats are public, so everyone will uh, be able to see what you enter. The plan is to take about 30 minutes and get to know our experts on the topic and then leave about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, the session is being recorded and there will be an opportunity to see it again on playback. And last but not least, I hope you're following today's event um, using at GlamHive or using the hashtag GlamHiveLive. So let's get started. I'm Cheryl Atkins Green, Chief Marketing Officer of Mary Kay, and I'm particularly proud to host this panel because the Mary Kay Global Design Studio is a sponsor of today's event. Mary Kay supports the success of tens of thousands of entrepreneurs all around the world. We're focused on both inner and outer beauty. And as part of that, we are committed to doing all that we can to protect our planet. So I have a lot of passion for today's topic. So without further ado, um, it's my pleasure now to introduce our guests for the panel. I first want to introduce Jane Mossbacher Morris. She is the founder and CEO of To The Market, which is a turnkey solution for ethical uh, manufacturing as well as sourcing of sustainable apparel, accessory, and home goods. I also am excited to welcome Matilda Payne. She is a designer, an eco-warrior, a social entrepreneur, and the founder of MH Couture and a co-founder of Extreme Upcycle. She is known not only for the distinctive jewelry designs, but also for finding creative ways to turn trash into treasures. It's also my pleasure to welcome Christelle Hall. She is the founder and director of Atelier Cala, which is also a jewelry and accessory designing enterprise. Uh, she also leads workshops, and we'll be learning more about that in the course of our conversation. Last and certainly not least, Tara Swinnon is a celebrity stylist, and we look forward to hearing from her how she is guiding her clients to make more of those thoughtful, sustainable choices. So let's get started. I first want to ask our panelists if they could help us better understand what women, what people need to know about sus making sustainable choices. What specifically should they be looking for, asking about um, in regards to how products are produced and how the materials are sourced? And if I can, I'd love to start with you, Jane. Well, thank you, Cheryl, and i um, so excited to be here. What an amazing group of women, um, and I love that we are coming, tuning in live from all over the globe. Um, fashion is truly global, and I think that's a really critical, actually, part of the narrative, because when we're asking uh, questions about who made our product and how it's made, Usually there are multiple hands. And when I say multiple, I mean tens of hands that have may poss very possibly touched the product that we enjoy. I remember when I um, joined uh, VF Corporation, which is a, a publicly traded company that owns uh, North Face and Timberland, that I had an opportunity to visit um, factories that made Vans shoes. And I couldn't, I couldn't believe how many individual hands went into making even a single pair of tennis shoes. And it was such a reminder to me that um, we have gotten to a place, I think, in society where we almost expect the product to sort of like beam in from space because it looks so perfect and it's so readily available. And there's so many units that 
we really forget that even very technical products tend to have lots of human beings behind all of those, um, the construction of all of them. And so um, what I encourage people to do is to begin to really ask questions around, again, who made your product and how is it made? And then really asking yourself if that process aligns with your personal values. Thank you. Um, Matilda, can I also uh, ask for your perspective, what are the questions people should be asking as they're making these choices about where to invest their fashion, accessory, and home goods dollars? Okay, uh, Matilda, I'm not sure if you are frozen or not. Um, can I also then turn that question to you, Christelle, to talk a little bit about what women should be asking about as they're making their choices? Well, thank you for this question. I believe that uh, women should be um, questioning where the materials are coming from, uh, if uh, they are sustainably sourced, uh, if they are cruelty free, uh, they should also be asking the conditions that the people who are making the product are working in. Uh, because it's very tragic. We've seen a lot of accidents and tragedies happening uh, in countries that are involved in mass production, uh, where lives are taken for granted. Uh, and in the organization that I'm running, Atelier Kala, the artisans are at the center of everything that we do. Uh, we will not go into production if it's not into their interest, uh, because it's not just about delivering to the client, but the people who are manufacturing the product are to be taken into account. If, for me, they are the most important, because it's their creativity, it's their ability, it's their hands, it's their imagination, and all these skills that give life to the product. So it's true that fashion is going very, very fast out, uh, nowadays, but a good product, I believe, uh, is timeless. And uh, really, to me, that's the kind of question someone should be asking themselves. First of all, where are the raw materials coming from? Uh, how are the people uh, making the product? What conditions they're working in and how they're treated? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, also uh, the durability uh, of the, the products themselves over time. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. So Tara, as you're thinking about um, recommendations to share with your clients and asking them about their preferences, tell us a little bit more about what you're looking for. And now what are your clients starting to ask you about? Well, I think the important thing, you know, I, I work in Hollywood. Um, and so for me, the important thing is fostering change. And the people I dress are sort of, you know, beacons and obviously have a large profile, a red carpet presence, a social presence. Um, so for them, it's sort of about um, helping them sort of create a trickle down effect um, around the world, right? So if they sort of, you know, create the movement, foster the change, um, you hope that as sort of social icons, um, they will sort of help, you know, continue to raise awareness um, to show that obviously, you know, if they can shift the focus um, and wear looks that have a positive effect, everybody can, you know. So um, I like to bring it to their attention. I obviously am in the service industry and, you know, want to make sure that they're happy and, you know, fulfill their needs. Um, but at the same time, if I can enlist them, you know, as team players to help, um, that is really truly one of my greatest goals. That's great. And I think, uh, as you pointed out, their opportunity to really um, set the pace and set an example for others is, is very powerful. Um, Matilda, I'm glad that you are uh, back with us. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about um, how the work that you do, the designs uh, that you create, how are those helping to empower other women um, that are part of your business? 
Um, basically, we choose to work with a lot of women. Unfortunately, because we have two companies, um, it's just the jury that the women are interested in. They're not interested in the other side of the business. Therefore, um, we always look at mentoring other WOEs, women, other women in businesses as well. And then what we do is we help them to learn and spread the practices of eco-friendly um, and sustainability so they can implement that and know how to reduce their waste and what they can use their waste for again. At the same time, we also look at catching um, the young ones and trying to give them some um, training on how they can make informed choices when it comes to career. So that by the time they grow, they know exactly what they want to do in terms of empowerment. We also um, involve these children in career guidance and counseling um, conferences. We also contribute to the education of these young girls, especially the ones that are underprivileged um, but are very brilliant in school. So we pay for their school fees so they can stay in school and grow to become very responsible women. Um, it is not easy come from to make informed choices and to be able to um, stand on their own because um, um, culturally, for some areas, um, women are not supposed to be the leaders. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's quite difficult to change their mindsets so they can stand on their own to be able to make informed choices. There are also areas that has women leading. And these are the areas we capitalize also getting involved at the same time. So it's, it's pretty much um, stages. What we also do is that we are so transparent as companies because um, we take the end user through the practices of how the product becomes what they patronize. We take them through it and then we share that story on all um, our products so you know exactly how it's became. So you know it's sustainable, it's ethical, and then you know that we are actually making informed choices when it comes to the environment that affects everybody as well. So it's easier for them to learn more and to be able to talk about it, to discuss it as well. Yeah, so basically that's, that's what we're doing here. Yeah, thank you. So what I hear is that's important as we talk about sustainability, it's not just the single uh, dimension of say the environment, but also for um, sustainable success so that the uh, people, particularly the women contributing, are, are in a position to uh, have a sustainable career, perhaps a sustainable local business. So it's a much bigger concept um, beyond, above and beyond the environmental aspect. Yes. Um, Jane, could I also ask you to share more about some of the uh, businesses and particularly some of the women-owned businesses uh, that you work with and perhaps help support? Sure. Um, when I studied uh, the retail industry, uh, which was a relatively new study for me, so I started my career at the U.S. Department of State, um, so working in national security, actually, so um, a very different starting point from, from a uh, professional background. Um, and I was actually working all over the world, um, focused on empowering women. And the biggest takeaway I had from my time working overseas, and I was in um, developing countries, um, and in, in many cases, really challenging countries like Afghanistan. The biggest takeaway I had was that to drive change, resources are required. And for women to drive change, they need to have access to resources, whether they earn them, they share them freely within the family, or they're legally able to inherit them, which in many countries um, is still a challenge. And so I decided to um, focus on the, the, uh, the part of women having the opportunity to generate income themselves. And I started studying uh, different economies uh, in the developing world and found that retail manufacturing is actually not only one of the largest economies in the developing world, in the developing world, 
but a primary employer of women. So just the, the clothes that, that many of us get to enjoy every day, it's very likely that that product was made by women because something like 70% of garment workers are in fact women. What I came to find though, when I was learning more and more about the manufacturing process, is that despite the fact that most of the um, producers, meaning those that might be working on a production line or they might be the artisans that are working um, for Matilda or Christelle might be women, the vast majority of managers in factories and the vast majority of owners are actually men. Which again, you know, I have no, uh, you know, no, no, no problem with men, of course. But I thought, gosh, here we have women that are doing a lot of the work, but they're not necessarily the ones that are in power. So how do we elevate women-owned and operated suppliers so that they can have a fair shake at bidding for production, um, meaning manufacturing opportunities for big brands, retailers, and corporations. And so uh, to the market, what we do is we identify incredible makers like a Christelle, like a Matilda, um, who are operating, um, who have brilliant product, who have wonderful quality, um, but who may or may not be selling at scale in the United States. And then we tap into them as part of our supply chain. So when we go to a client like a Madewell and say, Madewell, we would love to start producing for you. And we have a brilliant upcycled horn jewelry maker named Christelle that we think we could do some really brilliant pieces for you. Then they are then able to tap into that opportunity because we have presented it to them in a way that it can work for their assortment. Um, it can work for uh, their sort of aesthetic. And so um, it's, it's very exciting to be a part of trying to shift the gender equity um, in fashion so that women are not only working hard in the industry, but we're actually financially benefiting from the industry. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Certainly one of the opportunities with this panel today is to raise awareness, to share information, um, because it's, it doesn't seem yet to be quite as readily available. Um, Tara, if I can ask you, as you are uh, thinking about um, how you source uh, opportunities and recommendations for your clients, where do you go for information? How are you finding out more about some of the uh, different types of resources that are uh, working harder for women? Um, well, you know, I think post pandemic transparency has become a much larger thing. So I think, you know, more brands are jumping on the bandwagon and realizing that, you know, the customer is starting to, you know, have a conscience and really, you know, sort of demand some accountability for everything that they do on every level um, of the chain. So um, I think more brands are putting it out there themselves, which is really, really helpful because I think, um, you know, one of the, you know, biggest incentives that I try and teach now is that everyone really should try and take the responsibility to learn, like we said, where their item came from, who made it, you know, um, and, you know, obviously make sure that it's not sacrificing or exploiting, you know, the yeah. environment or its people. Um, but that being said, you know, I do love that that is something that is changing. Obviously, social media is a great, you know, tool to utilize the internet in general. I mean, it's wonderful to see, um, you know, and then I think this community, you know, the community, things like this, when people get put together and, you know, even today, I wasn't aware of Christelle, you know, or Matilda's pieces. I will now seek them out, see if I can, you know, sort of um, try to uplift, you know, you know, these designers that are really doing wonderful things and spotlight them, you know, and I think that's, that's sort of how it all helps, you know, the more and more people that start championing these practices, the more, you know, um, information, you know, is out there for everybody to see. So, yeah. Great, thank you. So the next question I'd love to hear from each of you, and I'll start with uh, Christelle. And the question is around, um, does sustainable fashion, you know, these, you know, beautiful designer jewelry pieces, are they, are they expensive? We often hear that it takes more time and effort. We wanna make sure that the people who produce these goods are, are being compensated well. 
that starts to suggest that maybe these pieces um, might be more expensive than a lot of budgets can accommodate. Could you just talk a little bit about how you approach um, your designs and, and that balance, if you will, between quality, quality and affordability? This is an excellent question. Um, I have to say that when I started making jewelry, I went into really, um, I could say my personal style that I was experimenting, making statement pieces like uh, a necklace like this, for instance, wow. <laughs> which are big and gold and loud, which I still do. Uh, but with the, the channel that uh, Jane's organization has opened for us, uh, we've realized that uh, production in larger quantity uh, is important for us to stay alive. Um, in terms of price, uh, handmade is definitely more expensive than what we would uh, call uh, mass produced. But as Jane stated earlier, there is always a pair of hands behind every single thing. Even if it's in H&M or Zara or whatever organization, but the conditions of production are not what is the core of what motivates these type of organizations. So we may be more expensive, but we are not in the luxury uh, tier of prices, uh, if you see what I mean. Uh, like for $20, you can uh, start buying a nice handmade product. Even some lines start uh, lower at $10 and up. So um, if your values are to really uh, encourage, um, I can say, uh, sustainable jobs, employment, and uh, people that can really have a living uh, with the revenue that they're making. Mm -hmm. uh, I think spending uh, $5 versus uh, maybe 15, uh, I think this $10 is not going to make much of a difference at the end of the day for the mm -hmm. consumer. But the extra dollar that we may get in the wholesale process, believe me, uh, this is what will make a difference in order to pay the artisans above minimum wage. Yeah. Because yes. in my organization, uh, we are double uh, the minimum wage, uh, at least. Uh, we give bonuses uh, to, to the artisans uh, when we have bigger orders. So we give them an interest and incentives that other private organizations uh, don't want to get into, you know? Uh, yeah. yeah, we're a small organization. Uh, to me, it's important, you know, uh, because what we are looking for is for the advan advancement of each and every one that is participating uh, in the production. Yeah, no, thank you. And I appreciate you dimensioning that, you know, something might be uh, maybe five or ten dollars more than an alternative, but that's basically it could be a latte or two, but it makes such a big difference and it really is an investment. Exactly. Um, Matilda, can I also also ask you a little bit about how you think about the value proposition and um, opportunities to make sure that some of your designs are affordable and accessible uh, to, you know, different budget levels. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, basically, our products are a range of high earned and then straight down to the ordinary people. Everybody can find something for themselves. Um, what we usually do is um, we don't compromise on quality and because our raw materials are carefully picked, handpicked from the environment. And we complement that with what already exists, such as the corals, the pearls, um, the beads that we find, the pots and all that. Therefore, we have a variety. We have a whole range of that as well. So basically, ours is just making sure that the quality is on point. It's high-end and most of the high-end ones are one of a kind. 
and we customize as well. Um, what we also do is that because we work with our supply chain, we know exactly what is coming from her and the processes they go through. And we share those processes, as I said earlier, with our clientele. So they know exactly what went into the product before it became what it is. And so the prices can be defined through that. For the high end, we usually um, try to attend a lot of international fairs. And we do more online work now because um, of the COVID situation. And so we do a lot of digital trade shows. We've done Kuteri, New York now. We're also present at Ambiente um, in 2019 as well as um, New York night now as well in 2019. And luckily we have clients such as um, Iris Upfield. So if you have a client like that, it means that whatever you produce for her should be one of a kind and sure. exclusive to her. So we have products for her range. We have products for another client like Rita Mali. We have products for the ordinary person as well. So our range starts from about $20 for the earrings and some bracelets and necklaces. And then we also have high-end which starts from about $150 to as much as a thousand plus dollars. So okay. there's a range and based on what goes into the products, that's how we're able to um, price them. Um, also, we also make sure that our clientele know that whatever product they're purchasing is for a purpose. And it's solving a problem, not just in the environment, but it's contributing to the education of young girls in our society. It's also helping so we can groom a lot more young girls to become responsible and make informed choices when it comes to career. So they do know that there is a social impact part of the product. Apart from it looking good and solving a, a problem environmentally, it's also helping the communities in our country as well. So we take all these things into consideration when we are pricing and we make sure that there's something for everyone. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Um, our time is actually going by quickly and there are questions starting to come in. Thank you. Uh, folks want to understand where they can buy some of these uh, designs that you're talking about. And I'll give you an opportunity to share, but I'll, I'll ask a, a broad question for each of you. And, and that's around, what are some of the uh, brands, designers uh, that you are seeing um, kind of stepping into the forefront, stepping into the lead? Uh, Tara, you mentioned that more and more brands and retailers are starting uh, to, to move in, in this better direction. Um, can you share or are you comfortable sharing um, some brands and retailers uh, that it would be good for us to, to look for? Yeah, I mean, I think um, on the high-end designer market, you know, you always have your classics like Stella McCartney, you know, who've been champions from the beginning. Um, but, you know, that being said, I think a lot of high-end designers are starting to, you know, for me as a vegan, um, that's always been a really important thing to ditch fur, right? So Valentino last week, you have brands like Gucci, Prada, Jimmy Choo, they're all at least sort of making way in that direction. Um, and then you have brands like McQueen who set targets, you know, for like 2025 um, to sort of, you know, reduce greenhouse gases by 50%, let's say, you know, per unit or brands like Nordstrom, you know, as far as, you know, multi-brand retailers that are same thing, sort of, you know, creating these platforms like their sustainable style platform where they aim to sort of, you know, have 15% of the product be sustainable in at least one of three major ways. Um, so I think, you know, you have a lot of brands that are at least trying to tackle one thing, right? Whether it's socioeconomic, whether it's environmental, whether it's, you know, changing 
their carbon footprint, their waste, what have you, um, most brands are starting to attack at least one, if not multiple okay. areas where they can improve. So, you know, it, it's one thing I think we always talk about with sustainable fashion. There like is no such thing, right? I mean, it's a product, it creates what it's it. So the idea is to make sure that it does the least amount of damage possible. So I think, yeah, yeah there's a lot of brands, you know, um, that are really starting to set the gold standard. You know, you have like your Patagonias, your Levi's, um, you know, brands like that, Alternative Apparel, Bowdoin, who have really set the bar high, um, which is great because then other brands can just sort of look to see mm -hmm. and use people like Jane to make the connections. Um, so it's good, it's changing, you know, but I think yeah. a lot of brands are is the good news. Yeah. And I love what you said. It, it's not necessarily the product is sustainable. It's really more the policies and practices of the company behind the product. And that's really where I think um, we, we need to uh, continue to look closely. And as you mentioned before, uh, we're looking and expecting those companies to be more transparent. Yes. Um, Jane, I'd love to come back to you um, and hear more from you about uh, some of the companies that you're working with or you might want to work with in the future. I know you mentioned Madewell. What are some of the other uh, companies that you're uh, currently or hopefully uh, partnering with in the future? Um, well, what's what I think is uh, important for part of to the marks that to the market's thesis is how do we as a business make sustainability accessible? Um, and so one of the things that we've done uh, <laughs> is much like Ms. Matilda and Christelle have noted around having a range of product um, that is uh, accessible to different markets is doing the same. Uh, for to the market. So for example, um, we do a lot of cut and sew production in apparel and accessories in Gotts Organic Fabric, which is a very stringent organic cotton certification that applies to both the cotton itself, how it's grown, um, the farming and working conditions, as well as to the factory that's actually doing the cut and sew. And so because we do so much scale around GOTS certified organic cotton, we're actually able to service companies like TJ Maxx in Burlington and Nordstrom Rack because we're able to hit their target price points by engineering a silhouette, so a product that is um, price accessible and also leveraging economies of scale of having the same type of material um, being used in multiple types of goods. So those are all examples of clients um, that we actually service. Um, we also get to do uh, more expensive um, items like um, getting to do giftables for Bloomingdale's where we're able to, to um, offer a higher price point and maybe fewer units, more artisanal um, that allow for that sort of um, target market to have access to even more unique goods, um, even more high-end goods. So I think uh, as a business, um, our, our mission is to actually change retail manufacturing to empower people and protect the planet. So it's a really big mission. And for us to actually drive change, we have to drive volume. But we do so by, do so by driving volume in both um, those uh, clients who have significant purchasing power, who are buying thousands and thousands and thousands of units of a good, and those who might be buying hundreds of units of a good. But I would encourage um, when people are trying to sort of think through, well, where could I buy um, sustainable fashion? I would even start with Google searches around things like organic um, mm -hmm. organic cotton, for example, or recycled polyester. Those are both from an apparel side, um, really easy terms to be searching for. Um, similarly, I think I saw a chat function pop up um, from the real real. I'm absolutely thinking about um, the resale market and, and secondhand fashion is also a great place um, to make sure that the life of a product is extended that much further. I'm actually wearing a blouse that um, I bought secondhand literally through um, my glam hive stylists, um, which is incredible because it is bringing this um, this conversation full circle. But um, I think as we think about price points, um, I would encourage folks to take a term like an organic cotton or a fair trade and to take a category that you're interested in, organic cotton t-shirt, organic cotton underwear, fair trade jeans, 
and see what comes up. You'd be surprised how many price successful things at a place like a Gap at a Madewell are in fact available to you. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, so Tara, thinking about you know, the, the future of fashion events, do you see us um, moving quickly from say a red carpet to a, a green carpet? And, and what would one wear on a green carpet event, a green carpet <laughs> event? <laughs> I mean, I do think that the red carpet is, you know, transforming itself now, you know, I think you saw a shift, you know, post sort of, you know, once the time's up movement happened and there was the voter movement and, you know, sort of people are using the red carpet as a platform for change. So I think, you know, it, it is becoming something where um, people are being very, a lot more, um, you know, discriminative of what they put on their body because they know that whatever you're putting on, you're standing for essentially. Mm -hmm. So um, it is shifting in that respect, um, which is great. It's again, it's that idea of accountability, you know, so, uh, but I do think that um, in general, it will continue happening. And the best we can hope for is that people do use it, you know, as a voice for change for positive yeah. uh, things. Um, but yeah, I mean, we do have a green carpet, you know, the green carpet awards, uh, which I was a part of this year, um, you know, is fast and furious um, over, you know, in Europe and, and is gaining momentum as we speak, you know, so yeah, it's a good thing. I think hopefully it'll continue to, you know, be an important thing. Yeah, and definitely, you know, what we wear, be, being really part of that platform that we can each leverage, uh, you know, above and beyond our social media accounts, you know, really how we show up um, yeah. is making making a statement. And, and to your point, we're seeing that in uh, a wide variety of uh, events where women in leadership are being mm -hmm. very intentional, intentional yes. in terms of how they show up. Yes. And I really love just quickly to add, you know, that, you know, even myself as a stylist, you know, there used to be this taboo, this sort of like who wore it best. You can't wear something twice. Luckily, I think a lot of us are starting to shift that whole conversation as well, where people like Kate Blanchett are showing up to the Cannes Film Festival and things that they've already worn five years prior or, you know, so it's things like that that are really great. They seem, you know, minute, but they really are a wonderful way to show people that it's just, it's easy to do, you know, at least your part if you can. Yeah, that's yeah. great. So um, we are getting close to the conclusion of this panel. Um, there was a question in the chat and I did wanna um, provide Christelle and Matilda the opportunity to um, let the, the guests know um, how they can uh, find out more about your designs and perhaps how to acquire them. I'll start with you, Matilda. <laughs> so we're on Instagram um, as MH Couture and Extreme Upside. Okay. And then we also have a website, www.mhcouturegh.com as well. Yeah. And then you can also Google my name and then you can follow and find details as well if um, you want to. Yeah. We also. Um, you can I I can also get any um, you can send messages you can DM me uh, on Instagram and then I would provide all the necessary information that you would need as well. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. And Christelle. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, I'm also on Instagram, Atelier Kala IT. Uh, that's what you have to search for. Uh, I don't know if there will be a link that uh, you can provide afterwards. We also have a website. It's uh, atelier-cala.com. Uh, and uh, like Matilda said, just uh, Google the name and uh, the links will come up. Uh, we have a bunch of partners uh, in the United States that uh, represent our products. So if you search by Atelier Cala, you will find them uh, because we do ship uh, from Haiti, but sometimes the costs are higher for certain products. So that's why we have some partners uh, in the United States that carry our products and you can shop directly from them as well. But the DM is always nice. Uh, our, one of um, our main uh, product is to manufacture for brands. 
So if there are any brands listening right now that uh, wants uh, jewelry uh, in wood, uh, in uh, cow horn, uh, or we upcycle all these types of products. So uh, like we did uh, with Jane for Madewell, they sent us their designs and uh, we're working on the, the collection that will be coming out short. Well, great. Thank you for that. Um, we're actually just about at the end of our time together. I want to thank each of you for not only what you've shared today, but what you are doing uh, to shine a light on this opportunity. Um, it's clear, particularly as we go forward, that it is going to take the collective efforts of people, particularly women, being um, supportive of each other, spreading the word, making sure, I, I love the conversation around um, holding brands, holding companies accountable for their actions um, at a time when uh, we can no longer afford uh, to, I'll say, take you know, the, the easy way out, if you will, um, but to really be more future focused and um, really think about uh, the power of our fashion dollars and the impact that they can have. So again, uh, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Christelle. And thank you, Matilda. Um, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to get to know you and uh, look forward uh, in the future to hopefully uh, supporting your efforts as we go forward, building a more sustainable future. Thanks. So Thank for you. our guests, you. Um, you will have about five minutes or so to transition to your next session. Thank you again for uh, participating, for your comments. And again, this session will be viewable later um, as it was recorded. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the summit.